Welcome back. I will begin this panel with my favorite quote from Martin Luther King Jr. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. Letter from the Birmingham Jail. As we heard from Judge Katzman and Judge Bolden this morning, this year marks the centenary of the passage of the 19th Amendment, guaranteeing and protecting women's constitutional right to vote. Its passage marked the largest expansion of democracy in the history of our country. In commemoration of this important anniversary, the conference organizers selected Women and the Law as the theme of this year's conference and Women and Access to Justice as the topic of this panel. Just as counting women into the franchise marks a significant achievement for our democracy, this panel's searching inquiry into women and access to justice seeks truths about the state of our justice system as a whole. If indeed, as Dr. King's quotation implies, women's experience of our justice system tells us important facts about the overall justness of our justice system, let us probe together. What is women's experience of justice? We will investigate that question in three parts. A global look at how women interact with the justice system. A more local look about pressing access to justice issues affecting women in the state of New York. And a focus on one particular area of a special concern, human trafficking. We are fortunate to have two panelists sharing their research on these topics. Ms. Sarah Chamnis Long, Director of Access to Justice Research for the World Justice Project, will address us on the global experience of access to justice, particularly women's experience, domestically and abroad. Ambassador Luis C. DeBaca coordinated U.S. government activities in the global fight against contemporary forms of slavery as the head of the State Department's Office to Monitor and Combat Trafficking in Persons during the Obama administration. He will share information about modern forms of human slavery, particularly as it affects women. In between their presentations, I will share some insights about the state of women and access to justice here in New York, based on my observations as a board member and officer of the New York Bar Foundation over the last decade. One additional panel note, we had previously secured the presence of Justice Betty J. Williams to share the observations of the National Association of Women Judges, Women in Prison Committee regarding conditions for women at the Metropolitan Detention Center in Brooklyn. Unfortunately, Judge Williams is no longer available to participate with us today. However, the NAWJ report is available in your conference materials. We will also address post-incarceration concerns of women later in this program. First, let us define a few terms. What do we mean when we talk about access to justice? The United States Department of Justice defines access to justice as, quote, a justice system that efficiently delivers outcomes that are fair and accessible to all, irrespective of wealth and status. The DOJ seeks to promote accessibility and eliminate barriers that prevent people from understanding and exercising their rights. It seeks to ensure fairness, delivering fair and just outcomes for all parties, including those facing financial or other disadvantages. And it seeks increased efficiency that fair and just outcomes will be delivered effectively without waste or duplication. Now, honing in on our inquiry, 
what are some key challenges to access to justice in our times, particularly for women, and what can we do to address them? According to the World Justice Project, people all over the world face legal problems relating to employment, housing, education, health, and family life. How they are addressed or not goes to the heart of people's social, economic, and physical well-being. People all over the world experience consumer issues, housing, money, and debt issues. These can include problems with a landlord over rent, repairs or payments, problems with neighbors over noise or litter, becoming homeless, disputes over poor or incomplete professional services, problems with a utility bill or supply, insurance claims being denied, threats from debt collectors, extortion from a gang or other criminal organization, difficulty collecting money owed, and more. For a data-driven view, into the specific access to justice issues facing people, and especially women around the world, we turn to Sarah Chamnis Long. Ms. Long joined the World Justice Project in 2012. As the Director of Access to Justice Research, Ms. Long leads the WJP's thematic research on civil justice. She has managed the production of the WJP Rule of Law Index and previously managed a portfolio of 20 plus pilot rule of law programs incubated and supported through the WJP. Ms. Long holds an MSc in Global Politics from the Lo London School of Economics and Political Science. She also graduated summa cum laude from the University of Maryland, where she earned a BA in French Language and Literatures and a citation in International Studies. Ms. Long comes to us via a pre-recorded presentation in anticipation of a blessed arrival in the days to come. Ambassador C. DeBaca and I had the opportunity to listen to her record this presentation live just last week and to engage in some panel discussion with her. We now bring you Ms. Long's presentation as well as our panel discussion that followed. Thank you, Leslie, for that introduction. Um, as Leslie mentioned, the World Justice Project has undertaken um, two uh, research efforts um, aimed at understanding the nature of access to justice and the size of the global justice gap. So I'll be speaking about that research today. So I understand that um, the focus of this week is um, largely on the state of um, access to justice for women in the US and in New York in particular, but I'll be providing more of a global view of the state of access to justice and highlighting some of the gender dimensions of access to justice where the data have um, interesting and, and relevant insights to show. So first I'll be speaking about the World Justice Project's global study on legal needs and access to justice, and then about an exercise to estimate the size of the global justice gap, and lastly, some key strategies for advancing women's access to justice that are highlighted by the data. So first, our global survey on legal needs and access to justice. Um, some of you may be aware of the work of the World Justice Project, and if you are, you probably have heard about our Rule of Law Index, which is a quantitative assessment tool um, to measure adherence to the rule of law in practice. And the World Justice Project uh, collects two primary sources of data to produce this index, and one comes from a general population poll conducted every year for our Rule of Law Index. So this entails polling a thousand people in every country on a biannual basis, so we pull more than 50 countries every year to collect data from ordinary people on how they experience and perceive the rule of law and justice in their country. So the idea behind the study was to take advantage of the fact that we have had this ongoing um, large-scale survey um, that we were administering around the world and to develop a survey module on legal needs and access to justice. And this builds on a long uh, survey tradition known as the Path to Justice Survey Tradition. 
But one of the issues with existing legal needs surveys is that um, they have only been conducted in about 30 countries since 1995. Um, they focus primarily on high income countries and they don't use comparable methodologies. So it's really hard to get a comprehensive picture of the state of access to justice globally. So to address this, we worked with an advisory group convened by the Open Society Justice Initiative and the OECD. And they were working to develop methodological guidance on producing standardized legal needs surveys. So we got to serve as something as a guinea pig for this group. Um, so we worked with this um, group and the experts they convened to design a survey module on legal needs and access to justice. And we ran the survey in over 100 countries between 2017 and 2018. And before I delve into um, some of the findings of the survey, I just wanted to give you an idea of um, the content of the survey and then the general logic. The survey includes over 100 questions, so this is very much a summary, but it starts by taking inventory of the problems that people have experienced in the last two years. So we ask about 38 types of legal problems. Then we ask respondents whether they sought help, um, if so, from whom, whether they took action by turning to a resolution mechanism for adjudication or mediation, and this includes both formal and informal mechanisms, the status of their problem, their views and um, experience of the process trying to resolve the problem, their own legal capability, and how their legal problem impacted their life more broadly. So just to give you an idea of what this data collection exercise looks like, in most countries this is done through face-to-face -face surveys. So we work with local polling companies that go door to door to administer the survey. So these are pictures from our field work partners administering the survey in Nepal, Mozambique, Bulgaria, Mexico, and Afghanistan. In the US and other um, high income countries where there's good internet penetration and we can reach representative um, samples of the population online, we work with polling partners like YouGov to conduct the survey. So this is just a very high level view of some of the summary statistics coming out of the study at the global level. And I'll delve into many of these data points in more detail in the, the slides that follow. But we see that about half of people experienced a legal problem in the last two years. Less than a third accessed any form of help, and those who did were more most likely to um, to seek advice or help from a family member or friend. A little less than half reported that their problem was fully resolved. And 43% or about two in five people surveyed experienced a hardship as a result of their legal problem. And I'll speak more about that specifically. And just to give you an idea of what the data looks like for the US, um, for all of the countries included in the study, we published country profiles summarizing some of the data. Um, which you can access on the World Justice Project's website, but we see that 66% um, experienced a legal problem, about a third access help, and 45% um, experienced hardship. So um, more or less in line with what we see in the, the global data with a few um, interesting data points that I'll be speaking about later in the presentation. So what do we learn from the study? So first we learned that legal problems are ubiquitous. As I mentioned earlier, about half of people surveyed reported experiencing a legal problem in the last two years. Um, I mentioned that we cover 38 different types of legal problems for the purposes of fitting this on the screen. I've categorized them into 12 broad categories and have um, randomly selected 20 countries included in the study to give you a sense of how the data looks across different countries. But um, you can see that um, the most commonly reported problems are consumer disputes, housing disputes, and disputes related to money and debt. And the data for the US in particular is highlighted um, on the bottom of the screen. And if you're to look at um, the proportion of men versus women who experienced a legal problem, in, you know, overall, it's very similar, but we see that when we look at specific types of legal problems, men and women have different legal needs. So these are four problems where um, of those who reported experiencing them, many um, women make up a much larger share of those experiencing the problem. So these include um, difficulties obtaining child support payments, issues with um, domestic violence or intimate partner violence, disagreement over the content of a will or division of property after the death of a family member, and disputes with neighbors where the gap isn't quite as large. <clears throat> 
And similarly, there's a number of disputes that are um, more often reported by men as compared to women. So this, and this includes um, uh, violence or arrest by a member of the police or military, um, being threatened or har harassed by a criminal organization, difficulties obtaining wages, issues with antisocial behavior such as gangs, vandalism, um, or consumption of drugs and alcohol in the street, um, and problems with a tenant about rental agreements or property damage. So these are issues that are more likely to be reported by men than women. So when we look at what do people actually do when they experience a legal problem, we see that um, in basically every country, most people don't go to a resolution mechanism for adjudication or mediation. So we have here the same group of 20 countries and we can see the proportion who took no action, um, did not go anywhere for resolution, um, adjudication or mediation. Um, represented by the gray bar, um, those who went to informal mechanisms represented by the red bar, and those who went to formal mechanisms represented by the blue bar. And this kind of purplish brown overlap between the two represents those who went to multiple um, resolution mechanisms to try to resolve their dispute. And in the United States, we see that fewer than 20% of the of people with legal problems take action to resolve their dispute. Of those who do, half go to a formal mechanism such as a court or the police, um, and half go to a formal and an informal mechanism. So that could, an informal mechanism could include, um, you know, a community leader or some type of informal um, mediator. And in developing countries, this is oftentimes, you know, a village elder or a religious authority. We also see that many people don't see their problems as being legal in nature. So after we, you know, ask people a series of follow up questions about their legal problems, we say, you know, did you understand your problem to be any of the following and they can select one or all of these answer options and we see that most people understand that their problem is just bad luck or a part of life and legal is actually the second to least popular option. But as we can see with the orange um, X mark, those who understand that their problem is legal in nature are actually more likely to get some type of information, advice, or help. So this points to um, an important um, data-driven solution, um, which includes, um, which entails um, making people more aware of, you know, their legal rights and, and resources to deal with their everyday justice problems. And lastly, to expand on um, the point I mentioned earlier about hardships. So um, globally, we see that 43% of people or about two in five people surveyed reported experiencing a hardship as a result of their legal problem. And the most common hardships reported were physical or ill health, loss of income, employment, or the need to relocate. But we also see that the hardships um, associated with legal problems vary depending on the type of legal problem. So we see, for example, that um, people who experience family disputes are much more likely to report a hardship than people who experience consumer disputes. And this is also noteworthy in the context of um, women and access to justice. Um, as women are much more likely than men to experience a number of family related disputes. And similarly, uh, we can also see that the types of hardships that men versus women um, experience are different. So when you look at um, the rates of men versus women who experience any hardship, there's not um, a large difference. But we see that um, of those who report um, physical or stress-related ill health, um, women are more likely to report that hardship. And of those who report um, abusing alcohol or drugs as a result of their legal problem, um, respondents who report that hardship are more likely to be men. And lastly, um, we see a disproportionate impact on the poor. So here we have um, represented by the green dot, the proportion of people who receive some form of government benefits that reported experiencing a legal problem in the last two years, as compared to those who don't receive any form of government benefits and ass or assistance. And we see that in almost every country, recipients of government benefits are more likely to experience legal problems. And there's a gap of more than 10 percentage points in the United United States. Um, and this is um, a really important data point in the context of the United States, because in the US, like in many countries, um, women are much more likely to live in poverty and um, female headed households are um, more likely to um, rely on government assistance programs than male headed or um, married uh, households. <laughs> 
So um, we've been focusing primarily on civil and administrative legal needs, but I want to talk briefly about another exercise undertaken by the World Justice Project to measure this global justice gap, and it takes on a much broader view um, of justice. So. And um, you know, justice can be understood as entailing people's ability to resolve everyday civil and administrative problems like the ones we just spoke about, but it can also include people's ability to deal with criminal justice problems, um, their ability to access legal tools and protections, and guarantees of basic security and human rights. So with this framework in mind, the World Justice Project um, undertook an exercise to estimate the size of the global justice gap using a very comprehensive and broad view of um, justice. So you, what you see here on the screen are three categories of unmet justice needs. So starting with people's ability to resolve justice problems, um, civil, administrative, and criminal, people who are excluded from the opportunities the law provides. So these are people who lack legal tools and protections um, and might be at greater vulnerability of experiencing justice problems and people who live in extreme conditions of justice. So underneath each of these three broad categories, we have a number of measurement questions and people-centered data sources that we use to estimate um, each of these dimensions of the justice gap. So we can see, for example, there's 1.4 billion people who have unmet civil and administrative justice needs like those we we just discussed, um, 2.1 billion people who are employed in the informal economy, and 40 million people who are living in modern slavery. Um, so this is designed to give a multidimensional view of justice and to um, clarify priorities for policymakers who are working on um, the UN Sustainable Development Goal 16 on peace and justice. So when we sum all of these figures and take into account um, and adjust for those who experience more than one unmet justice need, we have a total justice gap of 5.1 billion people. So that's about two thirds of the world's population that has at least one unmet justice need. So we didn't um, undertake an exercise to just, you know, disaggregate the justice gap between men and women and see how many men versus women are in the justice gap. But there are a number of ways that the data tells us that the justice gap uniquely impacts women. So the first relates, relates to legal needs. So women have different legal needs than men. And as previously discussed, they're more likely to experience family related disputes. And those disputes are associated with higher rates of hardship. Probably unsurprisingly for most of the people um, um, in attendance, um, we learned that um, women and girls make up a much higher share of family related and intimate partner homicide. So while men make up a greater share of victims of homicide globally, women are more likely than men to be a victim of homicide by um, a member of their family or um, a victim of homicide by intimate partner violence outside of the home. Um, UNODC estimates that 87,000 women um, are the victims of intentional homicide every year. Um, and this includes more than 130 women and girls killed every day by a member of their household and more than 80 women and girls killed every day by an intimate partner outside of their household. We also see that legal identity um, uniquely impacts um, women, and this is uh, particularly acute in developing countries, where 45% of women lack legal identity as compared to 30% of men. So that puts them at risk of being stateless, and it also um, inhibits their ability to access um, various um, entitlements, such as access to education and health care. And we also see um, informal employment impacts women differently than men. So the nature of informal employment looks very different region to region. Women make up the majority of informal of the informal economy in Latin America, Africa, and Asia. But in every region, including in high income countries, women in the informal economy are more likely to be employees or unpaid contributing family workers, which means they are um, likely paid less, if anything, for their labor and are more likely to be exposed to poor working conditions. These are just a few ways that the data presented on the previous slide um, play out quite differently for women as compared to men. So to um, leave things on a slightly more positive note, um, I wanted to um, leave you with some food for thought on strategies for advancing women's access to justice that are highlighted by the data. 
So the first for me is um, the importance of, of addressing the root causes of women's vulnerability, including poverty, economic and social rights, and legal identity, which are associated with um, greater justice problems and legal needs. And part of this um, preventative approach includes preventing and responding to intimate partner violence. Um, I think another clear um, issue highlighted by the data is the importance of legal aid and legal empowerment. Um, and, you know, women's um, entitlements and um, the legal remedies available to them are only as good as their knowledge of these tools and ability to use them. So it's important to provide um, access to quality um, legal aid that meets women where they are. And then um, I would be remiss as a research director if I didn't mention the need for more data collection on the legal needs of women. Um, it would be really great to have a more in-depth study of this issue in the U.S. and to be able to dig more into the data on the legal needs of women in the United States, um, but also, you know, looking beyond um, diagnosing uh, legal needs and looking at the state of access to justice, collecting data on evidence-based strategies and learning more um, about what works. So with that, um, I will end my presentation uh, and thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Long. That was uh, uh, extremely informative and will give rise, I think, to a great deal of discussion and uh, I hope uh, some action plans as well. Um, I'd like to begin this uh, portion of our discussion by um, making an observation first uh, that the size of the justice gap that's been identified in this research is absolutely staggering. Uh, the idea that um, two thirds of the world population uh, is experiencing uh, a justice gap um, and then narrowing down on the types of issues that uh, are affecting women in particular uh, to ask this panel to help the conference attendees really understand what we can do to help close the justice gap, particularly for women in keeping with the theme of this conference. Um, what can we do to help women, for example, identify that they have a legal problem and not just a personal problem or a family problem as you've identified, um, so that they know to seek help for unmet uh, justice needs? Um, what can we do to help uh, women who may be victims of domestic violence uh, or human trafficking uh, to see the courts, and in particular the federal courts, um, as a place for them to go uh, and not a place of intimidation uh, or a place where they don't belong. Um, and I'd like to maybe turn a couple of those questions over to Ambassador DeVaca to bring your experience uh, as a prosecutor and as a diplomat um, to those questions. Certainly, Leslie. You know, one of the things that I think is important is for us to think about our practice uh, holistically, not simply what we do uh, during our day job, whether it's in our courtroom or uh, in chambers, uh, but uh, actually thinking about kind of the, the practice of law and, and what we can do as lawyers first, uh, those of you who are judges, what you can do as judges, but not simply um, on the cases that are brought to you uh, to litigate. Um, you know, you look at a, a slide like this and, and say, well, poverty, economic, social rights, those aren't really my ambit. Um, that's not something that I do as a, as a judge. And yet we've got American judges who've had the opportunity to work in the UN system, who've had the opportunity to work uh, on judicial trainings and with their counterparts from uh, courts around the world, um, who've been able to, to be leaders in the field. Um, and I certainly would encourage everybody to think broadly about your social impact uh, and how you can be a voice uh, for expanding access and how you can help close these vulnerabilities that result in the, this kind of a, a justice gap. But I think that there's also then things that can be brought into one's own uh, courtroom, uh, understanding uh, how uh, dependency works, whether that's in uh, domestic violence, whether that's in uh, human trafficking situation, uh, understanding the uh, root causes of vulnerability that a person who's coming before you in, in, with an asylum claim uh, may end up having. Uh, one of the things that I'm interested in in the, this study is that it hones in on this idea of lack of legal identity. And that could be somebody coming from a, a country where as a married woman, they have extinguished their legal identity, which was the case in the United States for a long time. Uh, 
Um, but also it could be that they are stateless. Um, they are from a place like Northern Thailand uh, where uh, large swaths of the indigenous or the hill tribes are not uh, given identity documents, uh, are not having their births registered and are effectively stateless within their own country, much less if they show up in your courtroom uh, in an asylum case. Um, so I think that being open to the possibility that folks from around the world may be in even more vulnerable situations uh, than women and girls right here in the United States. Thank you so much. Uh, those are, um, uh, I think, very important observations based on this study. I'd also like to invite you to comment a little bit on a, uh, a pilot program that you've discussed with me earlier about actually bringing victims of human trafficking uh, into the federal courtroom uh, to become more familiar uh, with the court uh, ahead of their formal appearance. Um, and uh, uh, I'm thinking really more generally of uh, Chief Judge Katzman's efforts to bring civics education right into uh, the courthouse, to bring people into the courthouse uh, as part of their uh, roles and lives as citizens and uh, residents in the United States um, to learn about our system of justice and to really feel that sense of ownership uh, of justice uh, and their right to access justice. Um, so that the first time that they are uh, in a courtroom uh, is not in a formal legal proceeding. Can you talk a little bit about your experience in that area? Certainly, it's, it's kind of you to call it a, a pilot program. I think it was uh, something that in some ways we were just doing on the fly. Um, but when I was at the Civil Rights Division of the Justice Department back before uh, I became ambassador, um, one of the things that we started doing was with permission of the court and with the um, help of the court clerks, um, we would bring uh, in the week or so before trial, we would bring the victim witnesses in trafficking cases into the courtroom so that they could uh, sit in the in the, the box, uh, the witness box, see where the jury was going to be, um, play the roles uh, of uh, a witness or a juror or even a, a lawyer. Um, we do a little skit uh, where uh, one of the FBI agents would knock over a, a cup and then we'd uh, ask questions about what people saw and uh, do a little bit of a, you know, how, how you might end up being cross-examined about that. Um, taking care, of course, never to, to do anything that had to do with their actual testimony or, uh, or what's uh, along those lines. Um, but one of the things that we realized is that it gave ownership and it gave, for lack of a better word, membership to the uh, survivors. They weren't suddenly coming into the, the court that next week when it was time for them to testify blind. Um, the judge and the, the courtroom were demystified uh, and not in a way that took away the power of the court or the, the uh, importance of the proceedings, uh, but made it so that it was a welcoming place. One of the, the two things that I would hear after we started doing that, the two things that I would hear from survivors uh, after that were, first of all, in characterizing the trafficker who had abused them, um, they would often say things along the lines of, he seems so much smaller now, um, having been able to see that person uh, from the witness box as they testified. And the second thing that we would hear uh, from folks after we started doing that is that they felt that the judge was there to protect them, that the judge was actually, um, whether it was a kind of a grandfatherly or a uh, an aunt uh, type of uh, relationship, that when they were there in the witness box, they actually felt that the judge uh, was playing that role of being their protector uh, as well as seeking justice. And, you know, I just can't overstate how uh, important I think that is. Um, it's the, the kind of respect that we see uh, folks treated by uh, when, when people are taking uh, oral victim impact statements. Uh, it's the kind of respect that uh, fuels an understanding uh, when it comes time to look at um, restitution uh, and other uh, issues. Uh, but I think it all comes back to the idea that these people who are from socially excluded and vulnerable populations who in their home country never would be uh, allowed anywhere near something like a courtroom or a courthouse. And instead they felt like that it was something that was theirs just as much as it is any of ours.
Thank you so much for those remarks. Uh, it's quite empowering for the people in this room to think about ways in which they may contribute to uh, closing the justice gap. And um, uh, to Ms. Long, um, I uh, will just respond to your uh, um, presentation by observing that the law is a powerful tool, but only to the extent that people recognize legal problems for what they are um, and then um, uh, activate that sense of ownership or entitlement or membership as Ambassador DeBaca uh, has stated so that they feel uh, willing and able to seek a legal intervention or solution. And only then will we begin to close that really stunning access to justice gap that you've identified for women and for all people. Thank you both so much for participating in this online portion of our presentation. Thank you, Liz. Thank you. Please join me in thanking Ms. Long for a really thought provoking presentation and Ambassador C. DeBaca for a really interesting dialogue. Those slides are in your materials in case you would like to spend more time with them thinking about the rich data and their implications. We turn now from the global to the local. As former New York State Chief Judge Judith S. K. noted in 2002, civil legal services can mean the difference between having a roof over your head or being homeless, between going hungry or receiving food stamps, between children languishing in foster care or being returned to their parents. For a family seeking protection from eviction, for an elderly person confused by the social services bureaucracy, or for a battered woman fleeing domestic violence, having access to adequate legal services can be critical to their safety and their well being. Judge Kay's words raise the crucial question. What particular access to justice challenges do women in our area face? Are their problems similar to their sisters in other parts of the nation and around the globe? How is the experience of women and access to justice changing over time in our area? We do not yet have complete answers to those questions. We do, however, have some evidence from the grant records of the New York Bar Foundation. The New York Bar Foundation is the charitable arm of the New York State Bar Association. Since 1950, the foundation has been raising funds and making grants to worthy law-related charities throughout the state. It has been my privilege to be named as a fellow of the foundation in 2005 and to have served on its board since 2008, most recently, since 2018 as its president. We have made the rule of law and specifically improving access to justice, the central theme of our strategic plan for my three year presidential term. With the assistance of our foundation executive, Deborah Ospelmeyer, in preparation for this part of our panel's presentation, we have delved into successful grant applications dating back to 2010, charting out trends in projects seeking funding to directly or primarily provide access to justice to women. Although impressionistic, our examination of these recent grants reveal some patterns that I think are telling. Legal services to victims of domestic violence are far and away the largest category of grants the foundation makes to organizations serving the legal needs of women. Projects serving this most vulnerable population predominate over the next largest category of grantee by a factor of two. As Rachel Louise Snyder observes in her powerful new book, No Visible Bruises, Domestic violence has reached epidemic proportions in the United States. 50 women a month are shot and killed by their partners. Domestic violence is the third leading cause of homelessness. And 80% of hostage situations involve an abusive partner 
nor is it only a question of physical harm. In some 20% of abusive relationships, a perpetrator has total control of his victim's life. I will note that countries including Britain and France have laws to protect against this kind of abuse, but the United States does not. One project that we recently funded in Buffalo, New York, was to help the Family Justice Center of Erie County streamline its process to provide one-stop free wraparound services for victims of domestic violence and their children through extensive collaborations with 13 on-site or on-call partner agencies. Part of this program, pardon me, prior to this program, victims had to travel between agencies, often with children and without transportation. In too many cases, this was not only time consuming and extremely frustrating, but unsafe, prompting many victims to return to the abuse. The system was too fragmented to access, not user friendly, and lacked a mechanism for providers to collaborate on complicated cases. Included in the continuum of services is a forensic medical unit providing a registered nurse to examine the victim in the private setting of the Family Justice Center rather than at the often cold and crowded emergency room or police station. The photographs, documentation, and statements provide a higher quality of evidence for the DA's office and local police department, as well as to any civil attorneys representing the victim in custody, divorce, or family offense proceedings. This program exemplifies improved access to justice for women in New York State and how those improvements can improve our justice system overall. Family Law Matters is the next largest category of grantees serving a largely female client base. Reflecting the times, one recently funded project provides web-based connectivity, allowing attorneys to remotely assist family court litigants in rural or other areas where there is a shortage of representation. The third largest category of grants directly or disproportionately serving women is to organizations providing assistance in immigration matters. One recently funded project exemplifying this area of need is a legal assistance project in New York City to elevate and empower low-wage Latina immigrant women in the workplace. A large and growing number of projects lie at the intersection of all three of our top areas of funding, domestic violence, family law, and immigration. These cases are complex. They involve matrimonial law, child custody, and oftentimes housing assistance, as well as immigration help and economic assistance such as gaining access to benefits or help with consumer debt. As we have seen, the dominance over the victim of domestic violence is so comprehensive, the abuse so all-consuming in some cases that the woman requires specialists in five or six different areas of the law to regain her autonomy. What strikes me when I look back at our grant-making patterns over the last 10 years are the increasingly complex needs and the ingenious interdisciplinary solutions that the legal services community is bringing forth despite perilously scarce resources. Finally, I note that the Barr Foundation is called upon increasingly to fund post-incarceration reentry services for women. Although the United States is home to just 4% of the world's female population, it holds 33% of the entire world's incarcerated female population. The National Association of Women Judges has reported that while males remain the largest population in the nation's prisons, the number of female inmates continues to climb, growing by more than 700% over the last 35 years. 
This sevenfold growth is attributed to stricter drug penalties, more expansive laws, and an absence of re-entry programs. The foundation recognizes the need for post-incarceration legal services for women as a growing need and as an emerging women's access to justice issue. With that, I would like to turn to our final panelists for this session, Ambassador Luis C. DeBaca. Ambassador C. DeBaca is the Robina Fellow in Modern Slavery, Gilder Lehrman Center for the Study of Slavery, Abolition and Resistance at the Macmillan Center of Yale University. He is one of the United States' most decorated federal prosecutors, the principal DOJ drafter of the US Trafficking Victims Protection Act, and a member of the team that negotiated the United Nations Trafficking Protocol. Ambassador C. DeBaca served in the administration of President Barack Obama as ambassador at large to monitor and combat trafficking in persons from 2009 to 2014 and director of the Office for Sex Offender Monitoring, Apprehending, Registering, and Tracking from 2015 to 2017. I am pleased to present to you Ambassador C. DeBaca. Thank you, Leslie. And um, we've got a bit of a slideshow uh, that we're going to go through uh, during my part of the presentation. Um, and uh, I think I'm working with uh, our tech team to get that up uh, on Freestone. Um, but I think that one of the things that's important, I'll just jump right in. One of the things that's important uh, is to understand what we're talking about when we talk about human trafficking. Um, I'm not going to go into the full on statutory language and everything, but roughly to set out the concept, this is about compelled service. We're not limited uh, to sex trafficking or labor trafficking, uh, but really what we're talking about uh, is the modern updating of the post Civil War slavery statutes. And so I think it's important for us to understand kind of why slavery, why that's the touchstone, uh, and then what does that do as far as access to justice uh, and excluded communities. Can we go to the next slide, please? Importantly, I think that the current attention that we're seeing to human trafficking today has to be seen in the context of more than 150 years worth of activism, jurisprudence, and courtroom practice. Uh, this is, uh, comes not only from uh, service providers uh, and uh, folks who are working in the political sphere, but this happens because of lawyers. It happens because uh, of lawyers that are working in a number of different uh, areas. And as you can see from the inscription on this statue of Frederick Douglass, not only is he calling for us to never give up our vigilance uh, about forms of enslavement, um, but what he wanted to be remembered as and what he is remembered as is not just an ab abolitionist, but also a suffragist, uh, somebody who fought for women's rights uh, and somebody who fought for labor rights. So we're talking about something that is truly intersectional uh, back from a time when we hadn't really uh, seen the advances of our uh, colleagues that are working in critical race theory and identifying some of those concepts. Um, but it's also about access to justice. I'm going to go through a few uh, Second Circuit cases over the years that I think are very important as far as what we've seen in the human trafficking or slavery realm that has added to our understanding of access to justice. If we could go to the next slide. Many people, I think, are familiar with uh, Amistad because of a movie a few years ago, but the Amistad case is a Second Circuit case. And the question that was before the court, both the, second, the District Court, the Second Circuit, and eventually the Supreme Court, uh, was did these uh, rebels, the Africans who had taken the ship by force uh, and tried to sail back to Africa uh, only to wash up uh, in Connecticut, did they have rights under US law? Um, and how could they claim those rights if they didn't speak English? Uh, they had a Spanish interpreter, but they didn't really speak Spanish. Um, they had an interpreter who was from a related uh, part of the African coast, but didn't really speak their language. Uh, and so interestingly enough, and a little known fact about the Amistad is that David Gallaudet, who was working on American Sign Language, ended up coming to New Haven and working with the Amistad survivors. And together, they basically invented sign language so that they would be able to claim their rights in court. We'll see how that plays out a little bit later in a case that some of you might be familiar with in New York. Um, next slide, please. Uh, 
We're not just talking about access to justice, but also access to the profession and what happens when previously excluded communities are able to become lawyers. Mary Grace Quackenboss, uh, who's uh, here, uh, the lady lawyer of Fifth Avenue, as she was known in the progressive era, one of the few women lawyers in New York in the 1890s. Um, and she, uh, by working with the immigrant population at the time, uh, being what we would call now a public interest lawyer, uh, she ended up becoming the first female federal prosecutor and ended up doing cases down in the American South where people were being lured to build the railroads across the Everglades uh, and enslaved in horrible conditions. In fact, she ended up driving uh, Franklin Roosevelt, Delavor, excuse me, not FDR, but Teddy Roosevelt's uh, anti-peonage uh, push of the progressive era. And that's, I think, very of a keeping with the, the women and activism in New York at the time. If we go to the next slide, we'll end up seeing that interconnectivity. Um, that these are people who were not making uh, that big of a distinction, as we sometimes see in the anti-trafficking movement, between things like sex trafficking and labor trafficking. Instead, you had women, uh, like in this uh, slide, survivor activist Rose Livingston, uh, who was actually uh, going, sorry, I, I meant in this picture, um, if we can go back to that. Um, we see Rose Livingston, who was um, actively going out and getting other girls uh, out of uh, the situation that she'd been in. We see uh, socialite Lola Follett, La Follette, who was uh, deemed the head of the Mink Brigade, uh, the rich uh, women of New York who were willing to put themselves on the line, literally in this picture uh, with a young girl uh, who was uh, working in the garment factories, a 13 year old immigrant girl. Um, and these women did not necessarily see the issues of legal rights and marriage, domestic violence, the vote and human trafficking or slavery. They didn't necessarily see them as separately. If we can go to the next slide, please. And I think that part of that is because what we end up seeing is a recognition, a growing recognition over the last hundred years that slavery is not simply what people thought, um, you know, men in fields picking cotton, um, which is what a lot of Americans even now tend to think about it. Um, but slavery was feminized even when it was legal. Um, this notion of domestic service, uh, the sexual slavery of chattel slavery, uh, women were in con the convict leasing system. They were in sharecropping. Um, and so we see people um, like Dora Jones here, who was rescued uh, from an, a situation of domestic servitude. We see these cases in the, in the 1900s really starting to extend to quote unquote women's work with women being identified as the victims of these uh, forms of exploitation, which makes sense because of social exclusion uh, and vulnerability that we saw women uh, living under up until even now in the United States. Um, but we also see the 13th Amendment not just extending uh, its protection to women and to other jobs like that, uh, but we see it as the basis for other uh, forms of equality law. Uh, we see it as the, the um, way that we can get at hate crimes, the way that we can get at uh, the anti-gay uh, hate crimes of the Matthew, the Matthew Shepard Act uh, and other things like that. So the 13th Amendment, a living protection that hopefully is something that we can incorporate into all of our practice. If we go to the next slide, please. This is not always a tale of forward progress. Sometimes courts, even judges that everybody in the Second Circuit re um, respects, such as Judge Friendly, don't seem to really understand the lived experience of the vulnerable communities. And so we saw in the Shackney case back in the 1960s, where he said deportation threats are not really uh, threats that you could have a slavery case from because that's not punishment. Nobody who was reasonable would actually fear being sent back home. Um, clearly a very different way of thinking about uh, slavery. So much of the next 30 years, and if we can go to the next slide, much of the next 30 years then was an attempt to undo that law um, because it was so important around the, the United States. And the way that that was done was, again, women were coming into the Justice Department. Susan King, federal prosecutor, in the 70s and 80s was taking the things that she had learned in domestic violence and sexual assault activism, taking the things that she had learned as a public defender working on involuntary commitment cases. And so she understood mental illness and disability. Next slide, please. Takes us all the way up to the 1990s where we see that disability is one of the ways that people were being held. Um, cases such as the deaf Mexican case in front of Judge Kershaw in the Eastern District showed the need not just for legal tools that captured disability uh, and psychological coercion, but included social services and support as well. Next slide. 
international attention was being paid as well under the term of human trafficking, um, especially around sexual exploitation, especially around the Balkan Wars. So Judge Peggy Quo uh, in the Eastern District, um, who I'd worked with on the case, uh, cases when we were in the Civil Rights Division, ended up bringing a landmark case at the War Crimes Tribunal that recognized sexual servitude as an issue of slavery. Next, please. These approaches resulted in US domestic law as well as the United Nations protocol um, that focused on prevention and protection as well as prosecution. And so 20 years on now, we not only see immigration programs like the T and U visas uh, that provide options to survivors other than deportation, but we're seeing increasing movements to vacate or expunge convictions for crimes that might have happened while someone was in servitude. If we can go to the next slide, please. The last 20 years has shown, I think, a lot of great progress with almost universal recognition uh, of the crime, ratification of the treaty, and modern laws being put in place around the world. And the research that's coming online uh, allows us to better understand the massive scope, 45 million people, uh, and distribution of the problem. But many people's understanding is limited to one version of trafficking, and that is forced prostitution. It's so much more multifaceted to that, with the majority of cases in labor, not in the sex trade. If we can just switch through these slides a little bit as we go. It's domestic service, garment, agriculture, even child marriage. But women are not simply the victims. Women are not simply survivors. Women are pushing the solutions. New York lawyers that I've learned so much from, like Suzanne Tomatora over at the City Bar, uh, or Ann Milgram uh, at NYU's law school. And one of your colleagues, if we could go to the next slide, one of your colleagues uh, who retired from the New York uh, state bench, Judge Laura Safer Espinosa, is working with the farm workers and through an effective auditing system that has real consequences, something that she learned in the diversion courts that she pioneered, she's not only brought a halt to the almost yearly litany of slavery cases in Central Florida, but has made a big difference on sexual harassment in the fields as well. Next slide. We can all make that difference, whether in our professional or personal lives. Modern slavery only happens when there's a demand for sexual services or cheap goods, and we can and should help the workers and their advocates by looking at our own consumption patterns and the abuse and trafficking that it fuels. So I encourage everybody to visit slaveryfootprint.org and take the survey that will help you understand how many slaves work for you. Because it often seems not to be happening when actually it's all around us. If we could go to the next slide, please. Those of you who took the subways in New York in the 1990s were surrounded by it. As for years, there were deaf Mexicans held in servitude, forced to beg on the streets uh, and the subways and brutalized if they didn't make their quotas or if they tried to run away. They were lured to the United States with promises of opportunity, photos of their friends at Disneyland or the Statue of Liberty, lies constructed to trick them into coming north. Judge Gerson worked so hard to, to ensure that their disability didn't steal their voices in her courtroom and when we caught a few of them later on, I was able to work with Judge Pam Chen uh, to finish off the case while she was still at the U.S. Attorney's Office. And so I wanna leave you with this, this next slide. Because of over 150 years of activism, of inclusion, of harnessing the professional impact and insights of women and other previously excluded communities under the law, the survivors in that case, the death of Mexican case, remain in the United States. Life isn't always easy, but they're free and they have a choice and a chance to thrive. And here's one of them, Jose Gonzalez, no longer enslaved in the land of the free. You see him here receiving the award from his job as employee, employee of the year from where he works as a janitor. And I think you'll recognize where he works. If we can go to the final slide. Thank you for all of you and what you're doing to apply justice fairly, to ensure justice is accessible to all and to carry that light of freedom for so many. Amen, Ambassador DeBaca. Thank you so very much for a really stirring presentation, extremely informative. Um, in light of the time, I think I'm going to now end uh, with a quotation from our recently departed hero, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Very much in tune with Dr. King's exhortation that none of us lives in a just society until all of us live in a just society. Justice Ginsburg said, that, quote, I don't say women's rights, I say the constitutional principle of the equal citizenship stature of men 
and women. We urge and thank you for your attention to the access to justice concerns that are particular to women as we strive to better realize that constitutional principle of equal justice for all. Please join me once again in thanking co-panelists, Ambassador Luis C. DeVaca, Ms. Sarah Chamnus Long, and special thanks to our subcommittee on women and access to justice who helped to organize and shape this panel. Professor Rachel Barco, Michael Bosworth, Leslie Dubeck, Roger Juan Maldonado, and Dean Michael Simons. Thank you so much, immediate past Chief Judge Robert A. Katzman for your leadership and devotion to these important issues and for entrusting us with this work. And to Judge Victor Bolden, who led us fearlessly through the complicated but so worthwhile task of helping to organize this conference. Thank you very much.